Okay, well, let's bow our hearts and our heads. Uh, let's, uh, in prayer, Father, I just thank you that uh, Jesus said where two or more gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them, Father. And so, uh, Jesus, I thank you, Father, for your presence here today. Uh, I ask you to open our hearts and our minds to receive and understand uh, what you would teach us in the scriptures today, Lord. Uh, the Holy Spirit is called the teacher. The Holy Spirit is, uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God through the Holy Spirit. And truly, we cannot understand scripture except by the Holy Spirit, Father. Uh, like John the Baptist said, a man can receive nothing except what he receives from above. So, Father, just open our hearts, Father, to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, sanctification is to be made holy, holy. Can you hear, can, uh, mm -hmm. They're saying they can't hear me, so. Is that? Okay, all right. What's that? Okay, uh, I, so, you know, of course, the, there's two different speakers. One goes to the video and one goes to the speakers here on around the building here. So uh, I'll talk, try to talk loud. Okay, so uh, the Bible says, Jesus Christ is made unto us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Okay, uh, and remember we talked about that, um, you know, Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Marjona, for flesh and blood did not show that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. We talked about how um, the whole Christian life it, it begins, is sustained, and ends. Everything is related to revelation, re you know, imparted by the Holy Spirit, okay? And we said in Scripture, the word light, light, represents revelation. You know, the entrance of thy word giveth light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway, okay? Uh, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights in whom there is no sh darkness or shadow of turning, okay? So, uh, but, uh, you know, there's two ways to understand that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. One is a testimony of men, you know, your pastor or somebody else like that. And the other is a testimony of God. The only one that matters is when the Father Himself, by His Spirit in us, you know, reveals that he, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's what Jesus said. You know, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood didn't show that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Okay? And, and so um, everything has to come by revelation. Remember Paul said, I was not taught the gospel by man, nor did I receive it from any man. I received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? So, um, and, and that's the way we have to get everything, all right? Uh, that's why the Bereans, Paul bragged on the Bereans, because when he taught them, he said they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, because they went immediately to the Scriptures to see if what Paul said was true, okay? So, the Scriptures are the standard, okay? And, and uh, <clears throat> Bible, you know, all Scripture is prophetic or prophecy, but uh, Peter uh, says that, uh, you know, prophecy is not subject to private interpretation. Okay, in other words, I can't just interpret from my brain or my reasoning or something like that and figure out what that, no, that, that's what it means, okay? See, God, when He inspired the Scriptures, He has a meaning in mind, okay? My, what I need to do is get in tune with Him so you know, what I think the Scripture is saying is the same that He means it to say. Does that make sense? You know, and, and that's why we, we have to have this testimony of the Holy Spirit to really understand what it says. And, and that's why we have so many thousands of denominations because so many people interpret Scripture from their own opinions rather than, you know, what the Holy Spirit teaches. Does that make sense? So, anyway, so wisdom from God is simply the revelation that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, on that rock, I'm going to build my church. And what's the rock? The, the revelation by the Holy Spirit uh, that thou art to Christ, the Son of the living God. 
The Bible says anyone who believes, okay, that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, okay? Uh, so uh, that's the testimony of the, of the Father in our hearts that, of who He is, okay? Does that make sense? It can't be a secondhand, inter you know, secondhand, well, my pastor told him he's, he's the Messiah, okay? Well, that's, that's fine, but I, I have to find out for myself and get the testimony of the Father for it to mean anything. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, so he's, you know, Jesus Christ is made unto us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Okay, Every, everything comes by, for, and through Christ. Okay, uh, it's the Father in Jesus that that uh, it provides salvation. Here's something interesting: if you read the Old Testament, the Bible says there's only one Savior, one, and that's God. You know. There's no other Savior. But if you go to the New Testament, it says, no, Jesus is the Savior. But the Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. It was the Father that sent the Son to die and become the Savior. But it's the Father in the Son that provides the salvation. Okay? Same thing with creation. If you read the Old Testament, it says God created everything. You know, there's only one God and He created everything. Uh, but then if you go to the New Testament, it says, no, Jesus create, creates everything. And there was nothing uh, made or created that wasn't by, for, and through Him. So, sounds like a contradiction, okay? But Jesus said, of myself, I can do nothing, okay? And the words that I speak are not my words. I only say what I hear the Father saying, okay? It's the Father in him that's speaking. He said, the works that I do, the miracles, it's not me. It's the Father in me that does these works. Okay. So, but, so it's the Father that gives the testimony that He's the Christ. Okay. It's the Father that provides salvation by sowing the seed in the heart of a man. You know, and then like Mary said, well, you know, how's this going to be? I'm going to have this baby. You know, he said, well, you know, the Holy Ghost is going to overshadow you, and therefore that which is conceived in you shall be called the Son of God. But the conception was from the Father, okay? And, and uh, so uh, righteousness, once we believe that, that, that He's the Christ, we're given this free gift of righteousness, okay? And, and uh, then Christ is conceived in us as a living, you know, uh, incorruptible seed. The Bible says we're born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible seed by the living and abiding Word of God. You know, so the first Adam were born the first time of a corruptible seed. You know, got a sin nature. But the second birth, that's why Jesus said you got to be born again. Okay? Uh, so, but the new birth, the second birth is when uh, we no longer, well we, we still have the nature and likeness of Adam in us in the flesh, okay? But we get a new birth that now is, is Christ in you, which Paul said is, the, is the, the mystery hidden in ages past, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, okay? So Jesus is actually, you know, he, just like in Mary, this life was conceived in her. The same is true for us, okay? That, um, so, uh, but now, then he, as we yield to the to Christ and his leadership, you know the Bible says that you know we confess him as Lord. You know what a Lord does? Lord rules. Okay. Uh, there's this little saying: if he's not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. You know we sometimes treat God as sort of a you know a vending machine. You know. There's, I, I think I've mentioned this bumper sticker that I've seen on cars. It says, uh, God is my co-pilot, okay? Well, wait a minute. He ought to be the pilot, okay? And we treat God sometimes as you got Him in your back pocket, so if something bad happens and you need some help, then, then you pull out your God card, you know? But no, he, you know, God wants to rule us, everything, okay? Uh, if that makes sense. Okay, now sanctification is the cleansing process as we yield to the Spirit of God and we learn to walk in the Spirit. The Bible says if we walk in the light, what was light? Revelation. If we walk in the light 
the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Okay? So, now you don't get all the revelation first time you're born again. Okay? The revelation always comes through the Word of God. Remember, the entrance of thy Word giveth light. Okay? So, that's the source of light. All right? So, as we read the Word and, and the Holy Spirit anoints the Word, brings it to life to come, you know, become a rhema, and it's imparted into our spirit. Remember, Jesus said, Man does not live by bread alone, but in every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, that word is rhema. So that's the anointed word of God. That, that's the food for the spirit man. You, you have to feed your outer man, okay? Uh, and we are pretty faithful about that, three square meals a day. But sometimes we only feed the spirit man one snack a week, you know? And then, and then you expect to be strong spiritually. Well, it doesn't go that way, okay? Uh, the Bible says that in the Word we should meditate thou in, or therein day and night. Only two times a day we're supposed to be meditating on the Word. Day and night. That's pretty much all the time, you know? So, uh, because it is life, okay? My words are spirit and they are life to those that find them, okay? So, um, Anyway, so, but that's the process as we get more and more revelation and we become doers of the Word and not just hearers only, then uh, that obedience causes the, the blood of Christ to then cleanse us more and more. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, when a temptation arises of some kind, the Bible says it's the grace of God that teaches us to say no to sin, okay? We get tempted. You know, and uh, uh, but but now I've got the power, the grace, to say no, I'm not going to do it. Okay, and every single time I submit to God and resist the devil, then I am crucifying the flesh, little little bit at a time, little bit at a time, little bit every day. You know, uh, and that is sanctification. Okay, now. Uh, salvation, we talked last week, I think, about how uh, the revelation that thou art to Christ, the Son of the living God, it comes in an instant, okay? Uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, I think I've mentioned when I got born again or I got saved, I was reading the Sermon on the Mount uh, in a motel room. I was an atheist, you know, but I'm telling you, you know, uh, I, it's like I got hit by a truck, you know, just all of a sudden I had, boom, you know, God revealed himself to me and I knew that I knew that I knew that, you know, there's a God. I didn't quite understand who Jesus was and all that, but, you know, uh, but uh, man, I was changed, you know, uh, and, and it, it didn't, I didn't stop and reason it out and start thinking about it and then coming to a conclusion. No, God just went like that. Okay, and see, uh, and that's the way God works. And the same thing is true when you get born again. You may hear the gospel, but there comes a point when, you know, that, uh, you know, all of a sudden God conceives the spirit of his son in us. And we get that impartation from the father that thou art the Christ, the son living God. And we're born again. You know, the life of Christ is conceived in us. Now, we... So many, so much time we think that sanctification is different, okay? Uh, that sanctification is a long, lifelong, arduous process, okay? And that, uh, that you know, it's my job to clean myself up, okay? And, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I've tried that, you know? And it doesn't seem, you can go for a few years and it feels feel like you're not getting anywhere, you know? Okay, and that's because we have a wrong conception of sanctification, okay? Um, remember we talked about the Exodus, okay? That when God sent Moses into Egypt and called the people uh, out of the bondage there under Pharaoh, uh, that Pharaoh is a type of the God of this world. He's a type of the devil. The taskmasters are a type of demons. The slavery they're under is a type of sin. You know, and uh, the sin, of course, is related to the Adamic nature that, that we inherited, okay? And uh, so, 
Adam is the firstborn, okay? And so, but in the process of God taking his people out of Egypt, they had what they called the tenth plague, which was the death of the firstborn, okay? And that's when they went and got a lamb, you know, brought it into the household. And on the tenth day, uh, they selected the lamb. The fourteenth day of Abib, they slit the lamb's throat. And, that, uh, and then take that blood of the lamb. Hi, Lisa. And, uh, uh, you know, make a sign of the cross at the doorway there. Okay. And then uh, they roast the lamb, eat it. Okay. And the next morning, they leave. Okay. Three days later, remember that? They cross the Red Sea. Okay. And they come up on the other side, it turns out, on the Feast of First Fruits. Okay. Which is the 17th of Abib. Remember what day that is? Resurrection Day. It's the same day Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, mm-hmm. and, and that we see, you know, um, every everything has a spiritual meaning in Scripture. I mean, down to the fin- finest, tiniest detail. And you remember that the uh, Egyptians tried to follow them out. Okay, remember that. And uh, but you know, Aaron, Aaron and Moses had this rod you know, the staff or something like that and, uh, you know, holds that up and all, a- after the, the Hebrews get out, the, the water goes back and drowns all the Egyptians, okay? And the Bible says they look back and they see all these dead Egyptians in the water, okay? Well, that's a type. Those dead Egyptians are a type of the old man in those Hebrews that just crossed the lake, okay? And we, we said, remember, in the recent teaching, we talked about how crossing the Red Sea is a type of water baptism. Okay, and and uh, you know when we leave Egypt, we by faith apply the blood of the Lamb. We receive salvation. We're delivered out. Uh, we're delivered from the the you know the plague of the tenth the, of the death of the firstborn, and that's delivering us from the sin that we inherit from Adam. Okay, he's the firstborn of the human race. Okay. So, you know, and so that's salvation. We get this free gift of righteousness, all right? Uh, But, you know, we only started the journey there, okay? Then they went to Mount Sinai, and that happened to be on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after they climbed out of the water at the Red Sea, okay? So all the feasts, I'm telling you, all the feasts that most... uh, uh, Christian churches never teach on, okay, is there are powerful ways to help understand Scripture, okay, and, and, and God's timing and how He does things and that sort of thing. But anyway, after they went to Mount Sinai, they were given the law. Remember that? Okay. They were given the law twice. The first time, you know, they, the law was written on these tablets of stone, okay, and uh, Moses comes down carrying this, you know, the Ten Commandments there. And the people had already made a golden calf. They were worshiping the golden calf. They called him Yahweh, okay? And they were having an orgy because, you know, pagan, pagan worship normally includes sexual interactions and orgies and that kind of thing. So, of course, Moses is furious. And so he takes those stone tablets, throws them down. And see, that's a picture of us, you know, that have a stony heart, all right? And we break God's commandments because our hearts are made of stone, okay? You know, and so God sends him back up the mountain, and uh, this time he says, I'm going to write my law this time with my own finger, okay? And uh, it comes down, and the the word Deuteronomy uh, means the second giving of the law, okay? Now, Moses asked the people, they read the law, and he asked the people, Will you obey the law? And they said, sure, no problem. Okay. But did they? They didn't have it in them. They had no power to obey. Does that make sense? But see, they thought they could obey. The purpose of the law is to show us that you don't have the power to obey God's commands. It's just not in you. Okay. So the purpose of the law is to show lawlessness. It's not supposed to be a checklist to, to, you know, I did, let's see, I'm keeping the law, doing this and that, you know, because you can't keep it. 
you know, James says, if you break the smallest stroke of the law, you've broken the whole law, and you are a lawbreaker, you know? And so um, the purpose of the law is simply to show that, that I, it's not in me to obey the law. Does that make sense? So they go through the wilderness. They have all, well, actually from, from Mount Sinai, 11-day journey, they come to a place called Kadesh Barnea, okay, right next to the Jordan River, all right? Remember what Kadesh Barnea means? Kadesh means holy, holy, okay? Barnea means a desert wanderer or to wander off, okay? So Kadesh Barnea means to turn back from holiness, okay? But Kadesh Barnea was, you know, the staging place where uh, Moses wanted him to go on in and take the promised land. And then Moses said, God has given you the land, now go take it. All right? But they sent in some spies, remember, one from each tribe. And 10 of the 12 tribes came back and said, oh, it's a wonderful place. It's a land that flows with milk and honey, but there's giants in the land. And we are like grasshoppers in our own sight and in their sight, and we cannot do it. Okay? It's impossible. All right. And so, you know, what they said affected the way everybody believed. So the whole nation didn't enter the promised land, even though God said, I've already given it to you. Now go take it. Okay? Now, um, remember what the promised land represents? Holiness. Sanctification. Okay? Now, this is exactly the way most people in the church think about holiness. It's too hard. We can't do it. I've tried. The giants, meaning my sins and all those strongholds inside of me, they're just too big. I can't. All right? And, and God called that an evil report. Now, as far as the spies were concerned, it was a very objective observation of the situation. But the problem is, God wants us to walk by faith, not by sight. You know, so they were basing everything on their sight, okay? And they, which they then completely discounted what God said, okay? So, and that's, that's the whole nature of Christianity. God's Word is far more important. I mean, God's Word is better than, and more sure than the sun coming up tomorrow morning. You know, it is. You know, the Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. It says, does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? You know, so the whole nature of our relationship with God is simply to believe what he says. And then, Trust Him to do it, okay? Remember, we, we've got this little saying we, we say, you know, God is who He says He is. And God can and He will do what He says He will do. I am who God says I am. And I can do what God says I can do. And God's Word and His Spirit are at work mightily in me, okay? Now, in this world system... The people that are most um, honored uh, are those that are self-reliant, independent, kind of, you know, just have their, run their own show, they take care of their own lives, and, um, you know, the world honors that kind of person. They're considered great, okay? But did you know everything in the kingdom of God is opposite of the kingdom, uh, kingdoms of this world? In God's kingdom, the greatest among you is the one who's servant of all. The greatest is the one who is completely and utterly dependent, not independent, but dependent on God, okay? Because God can work mightily through such a person because it, they don't think they're a big shot. They don't say, look, God, I'll, I'll call you when I need you, but I got this, Okay? You remember God used Moses in such a mighty way. You ever wonder why God chose Moses? Okay. 
the, the little scripture in Deuteronomy says, Moses was the humblest man in the earth. That's why God could use him. You know, if, you know, if Moses, when, at the burning bush, when God told Moses, I want, to, want you to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. If Moses would have said, oh man, you got the right guy. I'm your man, you know. Well, God would have said, whoops, made a mistake here, you know. <laughs> so, you know, you know, our job is to realize, the Bible says, of yourself you can do nothing. The flesh profiteth nothing. Now, down there's a little box. I, I, we're going to look here right at this uh, handout. It says, sanctification is not achieved but simply received. Okay, I think it's in the back part of your handout there. It might be the last page, maybe. Sanctification is not achieved, but is simply received. Now, what's, what's the difference between that word? What, you know, if you achieve something, sounds like you put a lot of effort in it, you worked hard, you know, you made it happen. Okay, does that make sense? But to just receive something, you don't have to do anything, right? All right, that's everything from God simply is received by His grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's not, you know, it's not achieved. Salvation is simply received. The same thing is true for sanctification. Okay? Now, like I said, 99% of Christians don't, don't see it that way. They think, you know, once you become a Christian, man, now I got to be holy. You know, now I got to start doing right. I got to stop doing this, stop doing that. You know, and I got to get up early, read my Bible, get, you know, you know what you're trying to do? Trying to achieve. Okay? And, and you'll go, you can go for years doing that and not get anywhere. Not get anywhere. You know why? Because you think you can do it, <laughs> you know? And, and, but see, God, that's what the wilderness kind of is about. Remember chapter 7 of Romans, okay? Paul was born again. He was born again. But if you read chapter 7 of Romans, it says, the things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing them. I know I don't want to, but I do them anyway. And the things that I want to do, the good stuff, I can't make myself consistently do them. Okay? What a wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Okay? And he said, but he got a revelation. He realized that it's not me. Now notice that he wants to obey. He is identifying with the new man. Okay, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. So his mind was that of the new man wanting to serve God, wanting to obey, wanting to do good things, wanting to serve God, but he didn't have the power. Okay, and he fails and he fails and he fails. And he said, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then chapter 8 starts. It says, there is therefore now no... Now here's what happens when, you, when we fail. There's something that's called condemnation. Okay? At, whenever we sin, everybody's felt it, you know. Uh, the, the devil... The minute you do something wrong, break a law or something like that, the devil, you know, uh, look what you did, you know. <laughs> uh, and we, we feel this condemnation, okay. When we are in the flesh, act in the flesh, see the Bible says the flesh is condemned already because it's the flesh that is judged by the law. Because the flesh is lawless. See, when the devil comes to tempt us, the only part of me that can respond is my flesh. Okay? It's my flesh. It's always the flesh. 
okay? So, uh, and, and so I need to be able to discern when I'm in the flesh, okay? You know, if, if I don't know, somebody says something a little rude to you or something like that, and you feel this something rising up on the inside and you want to give them a piece of your mind, you know, straighten them out a little bit, well, that's the flesh, okay? Get even, okay? But, you know, and then you may feel guilty. You think, oh, my God, why did I do that, you know? But, but that's the nature of the flesh, okay? And so, uh, anyway, so Paul understood that. And it was, the flesh can catch you off guard, okay? But now, the next verse, or the next chapter, uh, uh, verse, or chapter 8, says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Okay? Now, there are natural laws, like the law of gravity, you know. If I go out and get up on the roof of my garage or something like that and um, get too close to the edge or maybe I jump off or whatever and break my leg, you know, I, I wouldn't say, God, why did you do that to me, you know? Well, God didn't do that. You did it, all right? Because there are laws, you see, that that's just the way they work. Now, there are not only natural laws, there are spiritual laws, okay? And so, Paul's talking about the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Chapter 7 is talking about the condemnation that comes from acting in the flesh, okay? But the only thing that can set me free from that is walking or living in the spirit in Christ, where the law, uh, where the, you know, the, the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets me free from the law of sin and death. Okay. Now, so walking in the spirit basically is letting Jesus, who's in me, run things. Okay. Now, uh, remember we talked about a natural man and a carnal man and a spiritual man. Paul says there's three different kinds of people in the world. Okay, The natural man is the guy who's not been born again. He does not have the Spirit of God, but he has the Adamic nature, you know, the, the, the firstborn, the nature of the firstborn of, the man, of mankind. And, and, but the Bible says the natural man understands not the things of God. He cannot know them because they are only spiritually discerned. Who can know the thoughts of God except by the Spirit of God? So if we don't have the Spirit of God, then we are completely disconnected from God. And the only thing that can control me is just my flesh. That's all I got. Does that make sense? Now, you know, we, we sometimes think that, yeah, you've probably heard this term, you know, people say, well, humans are basically good. You think that's true? No, uh, they are utterly, absolutely corrupt and evil, okay? Absolutely. All right, now we try to control ourselves sometimes, and maybe through good upbringing or whatever, but uh, we'll see you, Merrily. I knew you had to leave early, so yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Love you. All right. But, uh, you know, so... Well, the whole idea, when once we get born again, we, we change from a natural man to a carnal man, okay? The carnal man is a person who's born again, all right? But still, to a greater or lesser degree, the flesh still rules, okay? You ever go to a carnival, okay? You know, it caters to the flesh, okay? Flashy lights, pretty girls, whatever, you know, all right? And, and uh, chili con carne, what's that? That's where you got meat in it, flesh, whatever. You know, so carnal means flesh, okay? The Greek word is sarks, is sark, sarks, okay? So the, the carnal man is a sarkikos, is the Greek word, okay? 
You ever hear somebody being sarcastic? Okay, that means your flesh is sticking out, you know, you're, you know, sarcastic, okay? Now, so, uh, but once you're born again, we have kind of like we're schizophrenic, okay? There's, there's a part of you that's flesh, and there's a part of you that's the new man in Christ, okay? You, you want to obey the new man, but every now and then something happens and triggers the flesh to rise up, you know, and we stumble and fall. Okay, you know, John in 1 John says, I write these things unto you, talking about the scriptures there, he said, so that you do not sin. But if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so you, you ever seen a baby trying to learn how to walk? Boom. Falls down, falls down, keep try again, keep, you know. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he will rise again. All right, because the Spirit of Christ in us inspired to get back up again, get back up again, you know. Condemnation comes, your heart, you know, you know in your heart that you, your, your conscience bites you. And so we repent, okay, and, and uh, God washes away the sin, okay? And, but He wants us to walk in the light that we have. Now, like I said, when you're born again, you don't have all the light. You've got a little bit. God, God only wants us to walk in the light that we have, okay? And as long as we obey what we know to obey, that's what it says. If we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, okay? And we keep reading the Scriptures. We get more light, more revelation, more you know, and that, remember, the, the, that word is empowered. It's anointed, you know, uh, and, and it begins to change us, okay, uh, because it gets planted down in our heart, starts growing up and whatever, okay. All right, now, all right, now, in that journey from Egypt, okay, when they came out of Egypt, that's a picture of being born again. Water baptism, the old man, you know, is drowned in the Red Sea there, you know, and they come out, like I said, on Resurrection Day, which is a picture of the conception of Christ in us, this new life, okay? Um, and, you know, th there's a scripture that used to bother me. It says, the one born of God does not sin. He cannot sin because God's seed indwells him, okay? Now, I, you know, I was born again, and I'd read that scripture, and I'd think, gee, you know, I still sin, fail, you know, whatever. It says, but it says the one born of God does not sin. In fact, he cannot sin because God's seed indwells him. And I, you know, in the Word, it'll give you some light, give you some revelation. But that's talking about Christ in you. The one that's conceived in you, he'll never sin. He'll never lead you to sin. He cannot sin because he is conceived of the Father, okay? And, and so he is, he's in your holy of holies down in your spirit, okay? And our job is simply to, to, to submit to him. Submit yourself, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you, okay? And, and so, you know, God teaches us to fight the good fight of faith, to take hold of the eternal life to which we are called when we made our good confession among many witnesses. Does that make sense? Confessing Him as Lord, uh, etc. Okay, now let's go back to our Egyptian journey. Okay, so remember only 11 days from Mount Sinai they were at Kadesh Barnea. And God said, now go take the land, which is a type of holiness. Okay, now remember John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water under repentance. But he who comes after me will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. All right? And he will thoroughly thresh the grain down there on the threshing floor. And, and he will, with his winnowing fork, okay, will uh, burn it with fire to burn away all the chaff. Okay, so that, I'm not quoting it exactly, but uh, and so there's there, 
Baptism is two parts, okay? Now, it turns out that Egyptian journey has two water places where you cross, the Red Sea. That represents the baptism under repentance by John, okay? And then the Jordan River represents the baptism in the Holy Ghost. That's where you get holiness. But see, it looks, you know, we are so used to the failures of our flesh that when God calls us to holiness, we're just like that first generation back there that said, the giants are too big. We can't do it. I've tried to be holy, and I can't. But here's the problem. Sanctification, holiness, is not something we achieve. It's something we receive. Does that make sense? So it's not, I, I can't. You're right. It's impossible for you to be holy in your own power or strength. Absolutely impossible. See? Absolutely true. And you know, the reason God allows us to stumble and fall and fail over and over and over again is till you finally get it in this thick skull right here that I can't do it. Does that make sense? I, I can't. All right? But he can. See, sanctification, God's not asking me to sanctify me. He's asking me to believe that he can sanctify me. Does that make sense? All right. Now, the power, that's where the power comes from. You know, old Peter had a bad habit of sticking his foot in his mouth. You know, uh, over and over again, we see Peter, you know, one time Jesus is talking about going to the cross, and Peter started arguing with him. That ain't going to happen. You know, remember what Jesus did? Stuck his finger in his face and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Woo, that's pretty powerful. That, you know, Satan was using Peter's lips to argue with Jesus. Okay? And then another time Jesus quotes a scripture, all right, and he, that when he gets close to his crucifixion, he says, when the shepherd is struck, the sheep will be scattered. You are all going to abandon me, every one of you. And what did Peter say? Not me, Lord. You know, everybody else may deny you, but I'll never deny you. Kind of sounds like pride, doesn't it? You know? And the, But see, God, then Jesus said, to Peter, Satan hath desired to sift you like wheat. Now remember that threshing floor? Okay. You know, Jesus wants to clean us up. All right. He said, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you, Peter, that your faith would not fail you. And when you recover, when you get back on your feet, encourage your brethren. Okay. So Jesus, of course, goes to three different tribunals, trials. And when he's, when he's back there with the high priest and, uh, you know, it's at night, on Passover night. And uh, remember, because Jesus said, before the cock crows tomorrow morning, you're going to have denied me three times. Peter, you, you just said you're never going to deny me, right? And so, sure enough, Peter's denies when this somebody says to him, I saw you with him, you know, you're, you're a Nazarene, you know. And he kept saying no. And the last time he curses, said, I don't know the man, okay. And all of a sudden the cock crows. And Jesus' eyes meet Peter in the darkness there in the campfire light. And Peter suddenly remembers what he had told him. And he's absolutely broken. And he runs out into the darkness thinking, oh man, I did it now. But you know what? Um, then when Jesus rose from the dead, remember, I don't, Jesus came to Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? You know, do you love me? Remember Jesus denied him three times and three times Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? You know, and and. He used the word agape, which means the God kind of love. 
Peter knew he didn't have that kind of love. So he, he, instead of saying, I agape you, he said, I phileo you, which is kind of like brotherly love, okay? And Jesus asked him again, but do you agape me? He said, I phileo you, phileo you, you know? And then, then the next time Jesus says, well, do you phileo me? Do you love me? And Jesus, you know, Peter says, you know I love you, Lord. All right. But see, why did he do it three times? To undo the denials. Okay. And, and uh, there's a scripture in the Old Testament one time that says that the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam because he turned the blessing into a, or the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. Now, uh, Peter would have made a great Pharisee if he hadn't gone through that. But see, God will crush us. He crushes pride because humility is what he wants. He wants us to be broken, not thinking we can do it all, okay? Because only then, just like with Moses, it's the humble. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourn for what? Your sins, your flesh, your failures, your, you know, your inability to be who He wants you to be and do what He wants you to do, okay? And that's, see, it's only when we're broken and humbled, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and He will lift you up, okay? And it's only after... He lets the trials and tribulations and difficulties hit us, but it's for a purpose. Always, always. All things work together to good for those that love the Lord who are called according to His purpose. You know, we've made some comments. I know some people hate it when I say that, but literally, the devil works for God. You know, the devil is the minister of the curse, okay? And sometimes God will let him loose, okay? But all, you know, all things work together to good for those that love the Lord. All things serve Him. God works out all things according to the counsel of His will. In the end of the age, it takes one angel to toss the devil into the lake of fire. You don't think the devil, Jesus could do that anytime you wanted to. But see, that He's serving His purpose. All right? And when God's done with Him, gone. Okay? Does that make sense? Literally. God allows those interactions, those trials and difficulties to refine us, okay, so that He can empower us and we can humble ourselves so He can use us. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, so the, the reason oftentimes there's most, most Christians, I will say this, that you know, there's a guy named John Wesley. Remember him? Um, John Wesley discovered in Scripture, that sanctification, just like the new birth, just like the revelation that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, when it happens, since it's done by God, it's instantaneous. Instantaneous, okay? It's God never does things as, now we grow in grace, okay? But sanctification is not growing in grace, okay? Now let's look at it this way. When, if you got a field out there and it's got a bunch of weeds in it can you get rid of the weeds by throwing in some good seeds some wheat that doesn't remove the weeds the, before you can get a good crop you got to get rid of the weeds sanctification is taking away the Adamic nature so that we can grow in grace unimpeded by the flesh Okay? Okay. I'm saying sanctification is a subtraction of the Adamic nature. It's a removal of the Adamic nature so that the new man can now grow in grace unimpeded. Does that make sense? The reason we have such a hard time trying to walk a straight line is because that flesh is still down there. Does that make sense? Now you see this little tree? Now the tree, you know, the Bible often talks about human beings as being a type of a tree. Okay, we, we talked about Psalm 1. You know, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, 
nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate both night and day. And he shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, and his leaves also shall not wither. But whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Okay? Now, so there's good trees and there's bad trees. Now, remember we were born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, right? By the living and abiding Word of God. But here's the problem. We're sarkikos, you know, carnal man. We still got that old tree there. Remember we said, you know, the new birth basically, see, the, the corrupt tree that we are, is from Adam, okay? The, the fruit up on top there are sins, plural. The sin nature, sin singular, is in the root. All right? Now, the new birth erases all the fruit up there, forgives our past sins, but the problem is the root's still down there. Does that make sense? All right? Now, do you suppose maybe that's what John the Baptist is talking about when he's talking about, I baptize you with water under repentance, but he who comes after me is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And the axe is already laid at the root. See, it's the second baptism, the one by fire that sanctifies. All right? And so when the Holy Ghost came down on, in Acts chapter 2, tongues of fire come down, suddenly there was a sound like a rushing mighty wind. All right? And there appeared... You know, in the room there, tongues of fire that came down on each of them individually, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you what. Peter was a different man after that. He now was bold, got up and preached. And the Bible says that his, the words that he spoke were like a sword that pierced the hearts of the hearers. You know why? Because they weren't his words. It was exactly a like Jesus, the words that I speak, they're not my words. I only say what I hear the Father saying. And see, that sword of the Spirit, when it's anointed with the Word of God, I mean, 3,000 people got saved that day. 3,000 people, all right? You know, and, and so back in Mark chapter 16, the Great Commission was given Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. These signs shall follow those who believe. They'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They'll speak in new tongues. They, they take in, handle any serpents or deadly things uh, and it will not harm them. That represents demonic things, you know. It said, Behold, I give you authority over serpents and scorpions. And nothing shall by any means harm you. You know, we can handle evil things and whatever, but, you know, it's not going to affect us. Okay? Now, but then after Jesus gave that great commission, what did he say? But Terry, wait in Jerusalem first until you get power from on high. Okay? So here's the problem. They were still carnal. We know that from the way Peter acted. You know, he was, he was flipping and stumbling around all the time. Okay? But when the Holy Ghost came, he was a new man. He was a new man, okay? And that's exactly when Jesus went to John the Baptist and he told John the Baptist, I want you to baptize me. John the Baptist said, well, man, you're the Messiah. I mean, you need to baptize me. What do you mean? You want me to baptize you? And remember what Jesus said? Let it be. So that because it will fulfill all righteousness. So he's first baptized in water. He steps out of the water and then what happens? He's baptized with the Holy Ghost. Down comes the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. He's anointed, filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay? There's a testimony. This is my beloved Son, you know, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him, 
okay? All right, see now, G, remember, we're supposed to follow Christ, all right? And, and so the same thing that he goes through that happens to him is that's what we're supposed to do, okay? So from there, the Bible says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, right? All right, 40 days and 40 nights, the devil tried his best. The Bible says that Jesus is tempted in every which way as we are, and yet without sin, because he had the Holy Ghost in him, okay? All right, and, and see, so now, in fact, that every time Jesus resisted the devil, he was crucifying his flesh. He had a flesh because he was son of man, okay, through Mary, Mary's line, Okay, but he could not be the spotless lamb to take away the sins of the world until he had first resisted the devil and crucified his own flesh. The Bible says Jesus was perfected through suffering. Okay, Hebrews chapter 5. Well, I thought Jesus was perfect. No, he was son of man and son of God. So are you. You're son of man and son of God. All right. But see, it's the baptism in the Holy Spirit, okay, that crucifies, burns away the flesh. It cuts the root. And that's sanctification. And, and it's not something we achieve through a long period of arduous working, you know. And the reason we don't see that is because people don't believe it. See, Paul said in, in the New Testament, he said the reason there was that big failure the first time around when they were going to cross the Jordan River and they said, sorry, we can't do it. The giants are too big. Remember, Paul, Paul gave him the reason why that happened. What was it? Unbelief. They just didn't believe God. Okay. Well, guess what? You know, the promise is available for us now. It's all, always been available. But we got to do is believe it. Believe it. Okay? And, and we can receive it. You know, a lot of people, I've had an experience with the Holy Spirit. Okay? But not this kind of stuff. But just, I mean, it destroys the old man. It has no more power over you. Okay? The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. That's why Paul could say, I have been crucified, and it's no longer I that live, but it's Christ that lives in me. And this life I live in this flesh, I now live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay? There are all kinds of types and shadows of this in the Old Testament, or throughout the Bible, I should say. There was a, you know what a... Um, indentured servant is. Okay, you know, in, in ancient Israel, uh, remember, t 11 of the 12 tribes were given parcels of land, okay? And it was all distributed out, you know, uh, the Levites were the only ones that didn't get any land, okay? But the tithe was designed to support the Levites and the priesthood, okay? So, because their job was to minister the gospel, minister, or I should say minister the word, teach the law and all these kind of things, and to maintain the temple, the tabernacle in the wilderness, the Mishkan it's called, all right? But, um, so, it just happened that sometime, you know, a family would have a little piece of land, and say the husband would die, uh, and they'd get into debt, you know, they start selling what they have to, to pay the debt, and finally they run out of money. They don't have anything else. They sell their land, okay? And then they don't have anything else. All they got is themselves. So they sell themselves, okay? They go, they are basically adopted as an indentured servant to somebody else that's willing to pay their expenses, pay off all their debt, and then in exchange, this person comes and lives with that family and, and uh, serves them in exchange for food and shelter and, you know, on and on and on. This is, you know, but it's a, a loving, respecting relationship, okay? And then there's a, what's called a Shemitah, 
okay? Which is every seven years, once a person serves and as an indentured servant after seven years, okay, they, they are set free. Their debt is considered paid, you know? Now, you remember when um, Jacob, he got two wives, remember that? How long, and the first one, of course, uh, what's her name? Uh, Leah. Leah. Okay. How long did he serve for Leah? Seven years. Seven years. Okay. Because that was the bride price. Of course, he, he thought he was getting Rachel, <laughs> you know. And so, but he woke up in the morning and whoops, it's Leah, you know. Gee. Uh, and so Laban said, well, you know, now you can have Leah or, Le uh, you know, Rachel, but seven more years of work, you know. All right. And, um, but see, you see where that comes from? Okay. Now, so, but what happens after, at the end of the seven years, when a person's debt's paid off and they're free to go, okay, uh, then sometimes that servant has grown to love their master, the master loves them, and they'll make a decision. And that instead of being an indentured servant, they decide to become a bond servant. What did Paul call himself? A bond servant. What does that mean? What happens is, if, if that family that takes such good care of you and you grow to love them so much because they're just so good to you, you make a decision to literally be their property forever, your whole life. And they had a ceremony that they would actually take, take you to the front doorpost of the house, you know, and take like an awl, you know, punch a hole in your ear, little earlobe, put an earring in there, you know, which meant that now you were the property forever of this, this person, okay? But see, that is, the, when the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good, okay? It refers to that. Did you know that we are first called servants? But a servant is not a son. This, you become a son. You ever see, um, what's that movie, Ben-Hur? Remember that Ben-Hur? That guy, of course, that, uh, I've forgotten the... Charleston Heston. Charleston Heston. You remember he was a, a slave. He was a slave in this boat, you know, and he saved the captain who was a powerful man, you know, and that man, uh, for a while, he, he was his servant, okay? But what happened after that? He adopted him. He put the ring on his finger and he had all of the same authority that his master had. This is a picture, a type, that when we taste and see that the Lord is good, then we do what's called consecration. We literally give our whole lives to him and give up the right for anything and everything. All that I own, everything that I could possibly have in this life I just denounce it all and give it to him. In a sense, I'm putting myself on the altar, all right? And you remember when you put a sacrifice on the altar, what does God do? He sends the fire, okay? And what's that a type of? That's the Holy Ghost, okay? See, the, the, the sacrifice on an altar is the flesh. It's always the flesh. That's that Adamic nature. Remember when um, the King Ahab and Jezebel in the northern kingdom, remember they were serving Baal, Baal, or however you name it, same, you know, uh, in Samaria, okay? And they were all had false prophets, false teachers, you know, they all served the devil, okay? But Elijah said one day, let's find out once and for all who's the real God. Remember that? They go on top of Mount Carmel, all right, and they, the, the prophets of Baal, they say, well, you set up your altar, 
put your sacrifice on there, get, you know, stick him up there, and you call on your God, okay? And, and Elijah said, let it be that the God that answers by fire, that's the real God. Now, what does this mean? Why is God a burning bush, a consuming fire? When Noah comes out of the ship, remember what day he, you know, Mount Ararat that the ship comes to rest on? Resurrection day. It was, again, the 17th day of the, you know, seventh month, which then, you know, when God switches the calendar in Exodus chapter 12, that's resurrection day. That's the same day they got out of the Red Sea. Also got out of Noah's flood, got in on the ark. Also, that's the day that Joshua ran into the captain of the host after they crossed the Jordan River, okay? This is a picture of being born of water. Unless, Jesus said, unless a man is born again, born of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What, what in the world is that? Well, that's that second baptism. Holiness. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Okay? Be holy. Be thou perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay? And, and this, I'm telling you something, this is something 98% of the church knows nothing about. Okay? It's the difference between the called and the chosen. Many are called, but what? Few are chosen. You know, when the rapture happens, the Bible says that the sign of the Son of Man appears in heaven, and He dispatches out the angels to the four corners of the earth to gather together His elect. That's the electos. You know what those are? The chosen. It doesn't say that He gathers together the called. He only gathers the elect. Now, who is the elect? Those that bear the fruit of Christ. Those that are holy. Does that make sense? Now, people talk about, you know, there's no scripture that says there's a rapture of the church. No, it says there's a rapture of the elect. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. You know? So, uh, anyway... So, it's the Jordan River which represents the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That's when the fire, the consuming fire of God, consumes and destroys the root down here, okay? And sin will not have dominion over you. That's what he says. Yes? The Red River, I mean, the Red Sea. Red Sea. That's the water baptism. That's when the, you know, they look back, they see all these dead Egyptians down in the water there. And they come out of the water, remember, on Resurrection Day, the Feast of First Fruits, okay? And then they, only 11, you know, they go to Mount Sinai, which is a type, that's, that's um, Pentecost. Now, what's interesting is, remember when they, when they went to Mount Sinai, remember what happened? That, you know, Moses comes down with the law, tablets, throws it down, breaks them, so, you know, because they had stony hearts, okay? And so this is a picture of something. And then he gives them a second set of laws. This is what God is talking about when he says, Behold, the days are coming. Well, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with them at Sinai, which they broke. But in this new covenant, he said, I'll take away their heart of stone. And I'll give them a new heart. I'll put my spirit in them, which will cause them to obey my commandments. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The first law is the, the Mosaic law. The letter killeth, but the spirit gives life. Okay? The second covenant is the covenant of grace. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. 
Okay, does that make sense? All right. So, um, uh, when, so here's Elijah up on the Mount Carmel, and, you know, these prophets of Baal try cutting themselves or hollering and yelling, and nothing ever happens. No, no answer, okay? Then Elijah puts, you know, the, the sacrifice. Again, what's the sacrifice represent? The flesh, the flesh, the meat, okay? And, and so he puts it up on the altar, and then, then what? They pour big barrels of water over it. And what's that represent? We're washed by the water of the Word, okay? When at the very first miracle that Jesus did, what miracle was that? That's right. In six stone jars on the third day at Cana in Galilee, okay? All right, now I, I, I don't have time to go into all that, but I'm telling you everything has a spiritual meaning, okay? Everything, okay? The third day is resurrection day, okay? That's, all, that's what this is about, you know? And so, uh, anyway, they dump three big barrels of water on, on, the Bible says we're washed by the water of the Word. And, and at the marriage supper, the water, which is that Word, turns into wine, which is the Holy Spirit, okay? And that's at the marriage of the Lamb, okay? All right? You see the symbology? Okay? Uh, and th th there are six earthen vessels there. Six is the number of man. And it's earth. We're made out of dirt, you know? All right? So, but, so Elijah dumps the water, which, which represents the cleansing of the Word. And then he says one little prayer. And all of a sudden, boom, down comes the fire. And it consumes the meat, you know, the altar or the, the flesh, and licks up all the water down in the troughs around it and all that kind of stuff. That's what sanctification does. How long did it take? Instant. Instant. Okay? Now, do me a favor. Look. Um, there's um, I wish I brought, brought them with me but th there are lots of people that give testimonies of their baptisms baptism in the Holy Ghost is what I'm talking about and, and the, it, they're the most if you ever wonder if you've had the baptism in the Holy Ghost they, there ain't no mistaking about it it's something you'll never forget. It's the most profound experience you could possibly have in life, okay? Now, I haven't experienced that, but I, you know, before, what happens is before when God's getting ready to do something, He first opens your eyes so you can see it, okay? And see, the promised land represents holiness. Now, you remember when Moses struck the rock twice down in the, in the wilderness? That was a disobe disobedience, Okay? Because God told him just to speak to the rock. Remember that? Okay. But because he struck it twice, the first strike of the rock is a type of the crucifixion. All right. And it caused water, which is a type of the Holy Ghost. Okay. The words of life. My words are spirit and they are light to those that find them. You know, and it, you know, Jesus said, if you drink the water that I give you, you know, like he told the woman at the well, Jacob's well, he said, you'll never be thirsty again, you know. So but, uh, so, but Moses disobeyed God. Instead of just speaking to the rock, he struck it again, okay. All right, now that's a type of crucifying again the Son of Man underfoot, okay. All right, now I don't have time to go into that right now, but there is such a thing. Chapter, six, or chapter 10 of Hebrews, read that, okay. All right, so... Uh, but so God said, because you disobeyed me, you cannot enter the promised land. Now, again, there's, there's a type and a shadow here. The law cannot get you into the promised land. The purpose of the law is to get you out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, and to the border of the promised land, 
But only Joshua, who's a type of Christ, Yahshua, can get you in, crossing the Jordan. Okay, does that make sense? All right, the purpose of the law, so, but God led Moses, told Moses, go up to Mount Pisgah and said that he could see the promised land from afar. That's what the law does. It takes you to the border, you know, but it can't bring you in. It's only Christ. Who's he? The baptizer. I baptize you with water under repentance, but he who comes after me is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Does that make sense? And so Elijah was showing the real God, the one who can take away the flesh nature, can take, just burn it away. The real God is Yahweh. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So um, there's a huge amount of material in here, but uh, I'm trying to... Um, Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I am. I want to. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to. I'll. I'm going to have Luke email everybody some testimonies. Okay, of of baptisms. Water. I'm talking about baptisms in the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, when John Wesley just God gave him a revelation of of this of this holiness movement. Okay, um, and he called it. Um, um, entire sanctification complete okay may god himself the god of peace sanctify you completely through and through may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the lord jesus christ he who promised is faithful and he will do it sanctification is something received not achieved. Okay. Does that make sense? You know, but you'll never be able to achieve it. You know, and like I said, we, we can testify to that, right? <laughs> you know, uh, but John, John Wesley, through the revelation of God, realized this, and he ran all over the, you know, England and Brother Charles and uh, preached um, and brought a holiness movement. Thousands upon thousands of people uh, received this baptism. And what happens, it's just like happened to Peter. Peter changed from a stumbling idiot to a powerful preacher and evangelist. He didn't go to seminary. He got filled with the Holy Ghost. So what happened to him, it was exactly like Jesus. The words that I speak, they're not my words. I only say what I hear the Father saying. And the miracles that I do. You know, Peter, Peter's shadow, he would just walk down the sidewalk and if shadow would pass over somebody, they were healed. All right? Paul would just pray over a handkerchief. Okay? And then they'd go lay it on somebody that was sick. Okay? They'd be healed. You know, there was no end to the miracles. You know, these signs shall follow those who believe. That great commission that was given in Mark chapter 16. But remember what Jesus said? But first, tarry ye in Jerusalem until you get the power. The power. And see, we have a powerless church. You understand that? It's powerless. And what, this is what the problem is. Remember we, remember we talked about what, what is rat poison? 99% 99 rat food. And all it takes is a little corruption. 1% false doctrine, false teaching. You know, doctrines of men. What did Jesus say about that? It makes void the power of God. It makes it void. Because God works, watches over His Word to perform it. The minute anybody adds or subtracts to God's Word or tries to interpret it intellectually, give an opinion or whatever, you know what? It's not God's Word anymore. 
And he's under no obligation to watch over man's word to perform it. So it's powerless. Powerless. Does that make sense? Now, that's just the reality of things, okay? And, you know, we wonder, what's the matter? What's the matter, all right? You know, we have to go back to God, get on our knees, you know, and, and seek the Lord while he may be found, calling him while he is near, you know, draw near unto God, and he, and he will draw near unto you, okay? Uh, there is a tremendous revival coming in these end days. Okay, tremendous. But it's not just going to fall on us like, you know, ripe cherries. You know what I'm saying? You know, um, just look up a scripture real quick. Zechariah talks about, remember it says the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than that of the former house. Remember that? All right. Well, the house is the house of God. And where's the house of God? We're... That's us. Yeah. Know ye not that you're the temple of the Holy Ghost? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Okay. But see, um, I'm kind of going over time here, but remember the... Uh, In the book of Acts, when it says, suddenly there was a sound, like a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were at. Now, so that's sanctification. How long does it take? Instant. You know, instant. All right? And, but we think, if I think, it's something achieved instead of something received, you know what? I'm never going to get it. Because I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I, I, and I do exactly what they did back in the wilderness. It's too hard. I can't do it. Because I think I've got to do it. Does that make sense? That's not the way it works. Okay. All right. Sorry, I'm looking for a particular scripture here. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Now, this is a prophecy, actually, of John the Baptist, who had the anointing and the power of who? 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 Elijah. Remember when Elisha, Elijah said, you know, I'm gonna, God's going to take me. You know? And Elisha said, you know, I'm going to follow you. And so Elisha started following Elijah. And uh, he said, I want a double anointing of what you got. Remember that? And um, Elijah said, well, if you're here when I'm taken, you know, I've forgotten exactly what he said, but something to the effect, you got to be here, you know. And so remember the story about how this fiery chariot comes down from heaven, Elijah goes off, and then, but he tosses something down on the ground. What was that? That's right, this mantle. Now, what, what is a mantle? It, it was a prayer shawl. Okay? That's where the power is. Okay? You know, if you've seen these talit, what's a talit? You know, that's these little prayer shawls that, the, you know, these Jewish men wear. It means little tent. Okay? And, and uh, the, in the Mishkan, the tabernacle in the wilderness, the tabernacle was the, that covered structure with the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place, and it was covered with animal skins. That was called the tent. Okay? the tent of meeting, you know, uh, the presence of God. And then every time they'd had a morning and evening sacrifice, and every time they did that, the, the, all of the men would stand out in front of their tents, you know, and put their uh, talits on, which means little tent. So when they were doing the sacrifice over at the big tent, they would put on their little tents. That's the secret place of the Most High under the shadow 
of the Almighty. Okay, and and that part that hangs down are called the wings, you know, and they've got little tassels on the end called the tzitzit. Okay, and you remember when the woman uh, who had the hemorrhage for twelve years, she read the book of Malachi, and it said that when the Son of Righteousness comes, he'll come with healing in his wings. She knew that, oh, God, that's, that's a talit, you know. That's the, that part that hangs down, uh, you know, from the prayer shawl. And so she said to herself, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole, you know. She stayed in advance, and she shoved through the crowds, reached out and touched, grabbed the margin of the talit, Boom, healed, okay? Well, that's the uh, mantle that Elijah tossed down, okay? Now, here's what's interesting. This, behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of His coming? And who can stand when He appears? He, he is like a refiner's fire. Remember the fire? And like a launderer's soap. And He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. That's sanctification. That's it. Okay? Now, and John the Baptist... Literally, what's interesting, remember he, he had a camel's hair coat and he had a leather belt and he had eight, remember, uh, what they say, locusts and wild honey or something like that. Now, if you go to the, in the Old Testament, uh, Ahab one time asked somebody when he said, I think I saw Elijah, he said, well, what did he look like? Well, he was wearing a camel coat, had a leather belt, that's his mantle, okay? That's Elijah's mantle. Now, the, because of this prophecy that the, there was going to be somebody coming in the future in the power and anointing of Elijah, that mantle of Elijah after Elisha was done with it was kept in the temple for year after year after year knowing that one day this prophecy was going to be fulfilled. And the year that Gabriel came into the temple, remember, all right, and um, what's the guy who was high priest and John the Baptist's dad, what's, what's his name? I'm blinking on his name. Uh, um, John the Baptist's dad, what's his name? Ah, can't think of his name. Okay. No. Zachariah, okay, Zachariah, you know, he was an old man, his wife was past childbearing age, but they had this prophecy that one day a son, you know, this guy named John the Baptist is going to come. Okay? Well, the angel Gabriel came and said, you know, to Zechariah, you're going to have a baby. You know? And he shall walk in the power and the anointing of Elijah. Well, guess what was in there? That mantle from Elijah. And they pulled it out and gave it to John the Baptist as he was growing up. The power and that anointing promised in the prophecies from years ago was there, okay? To, uh, uh, you know, bring the Messiah in before the nation of Israel, okay? Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So, but anyway, he comes suddenly to his temple, okay? And, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is just that. It, it's a sudden event, okay? It's not something achieved, it's something received, okay? All right, now I'm going to quit, so let's close, our, close the prayer. Father God, I just thank you for your word. It never, never, never returns void without accomplishing that for what you send it, Father. Now thank you that the entrance of thy word giveth light, Father. Just open our eyes to see our ears to hear, our minds to perceive and understand what you would teach us this day. Right now, I know you are preparing a way for the, not the first coming of Messiah, but the second coming, Lord, and that you work through your people whose hearts are yielded to you. And just like you promised, you said, the things that I do shall you do also, and even greater things than these shall you do because I go unto the Father. 
And I just ask for your anointing on every one of us, Lord, to open our eyes and give us a humble heart to receive from you, to trust you. You said, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn and the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.